There we go. Um, hello, everyone. And today we're having Paul, Professor Paul McComb from actually from Florida, but he's a professor at West Virginia. What is it? State University of West Virginia in philosophy and in uh, social sociology. And his field is very amenable to the Afro-pessimist movement and the Afro-futurist movement in science fiction. So we are very fortunate to have Professor McComb here today. And I have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we proceed, just you know, to remind people about various things. So let me just get this out of the way as soon as I can. All right, so moving ahead to our next slide here, wherever it is. I think I'm trying in the wrong window. <laughs> I can only control these slides from my other window. Okay, so this should do it. So what I would like, can you all see that? What I'd like you to do now is please turn off your uh, microphones during the talk and use chat to post any questions that come to you. You can post them at any time during the talk. And uh, if you would be so kind, turn off your cameras to save bandwidth during this talk. All righty. Next slide is to remind you that we do have a YouTube channel. Hmm. And I can even say YouTube channel. And Paul's talk, among many others, will be on this YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and look for the Tucson Hard Science Science Fiction channel, and you will be there. So now I will move to the next slide. I hope you can you I hope you can could someone tell me if you can see this slide that's yes. Paul's cover. You can see it. Okay. So this will have to do for the cover for Paul's talk and maybe he'll start just with a, a brief synopsis of this yes. text that he wrote. I can see I, it. I will turn yeah. it over now to Paul McComb. Uh, thank you, thank you, Gloria, for having me. Um, I hope we're not disconnected. As I mentioned earlier, when we started, we're actually under a uh, tropical uh, cyclone watch here in South Florida. So hopefully we're not interrupted. It's been raining for the past couple of days. Um, the book that title that you have in front of you, Haitian Epistemology, stems from the understanding that uh, the, on the island of Haiti, there is a distinct epistemology, uh, uh, and epistemology in philosophical terms simply refers to the study of what we know, how we know what we know, and um, how do we come to know what we know. Uh, whereas in the West, Western society, uh, Western epistemology actually begins with Rene Descartes, uh, uh, and his uh, uh, rationalism, and would end technically with uh, Immanuel Kant and his synthesis of empiricism and rationalism. So for Descartes, how we know what we know uh, is through reason. Now, some will argue pure reason, but it, Descartes does not make that argument. He does emphasize uh, the need for uh, uh, that we rationalize what we see. So he does, his rationalism is also based on a sort of empiricism. And when uh, Immanuel Kant would try to take that uh, uh, part of Descartes and synthesize it, with the, synthesize it with the empiricism of not only John Locke, but uh, mo most definitely uh, uh, David Hume. Uh, and David Hume, like uh, Descartes, even though they're on opposite side of the uh, uh, um, epistemological uh, spectrum, Hume representing pure uh, empiricism and uh, Locke, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Descartes representing um, rationalism, both of them lead to a form of skepticism that denies knowledge altogether. And Immanuel Kant in the West realizes that, so he has to save knowledge by synthesizing the two. In his synthesis, what Immanuel Kant does, he holds on to empiricism 
and he holds on to rationalism through what he calls a, a noumenal world. He makes a distinction between phenomenon and noumena. Phenomenon being how things appear to consciousness, phenomenal experiences, and noumena being the things as they are in and of themselves. So what he argues is, we can never know things as they are in, of the, in and of themselves. All we can know is phenomenon. And he says the reason why we can't know things in and of themselves is what he calls a form of the understanding, meaning we are pre-programmed to experience the world in a particular way. We can hear certain sounds. We can see on a particular spectrum. And so therefore, the form of the understanding and then uh, uh, forces how we know what we know. So therefore, in, in the West, what you have is a synthesis, a Kantian synthesis of empiricism and rationalism. Now, what I argue is that there is, that diametrically opposes what you would find on the island of Haiti. Now, what I've done is to separate my talk into three uh, uh, sections. I will go into the history of Haiti, the rise of science or the type of science we would find on the island. And then I will go into uh, uh, what the, 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 the form that the science has taken contemporarily in popular culture, as well as in the scientific community, whether it's Haitian Studies Association out of Berkeley, uh, or, or out of Brooklyn College, for example. So those are the three things. That, that, that's how I'm going to form the rest of my talk. So on the island of Haiti, Haiti was known as Hispaniola, and it was controlled for a long time by the, the Spanish. And of course, it was founded uh, uh, in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century, and it became divided in the late 17th century between the French and the Spanish. The western side of the island would be controlled by the French, and the eastern side, which is contemporarily known as the Dominican Republic, would be controlled by the, the Spanish. And the French, it, Haiti, the, the, the western side was known as Saint Domingue. Uh, and the eastern side under the Spanish rule was known as Santo Domingo. The French introduced uh, uh, sugar plantations on the island as part of the mercantilist system in which the aim was to, under mercantilism, the aim, the aim was to own colonies and to control the goods produced or primary goods controlled by these colonies it was then shipped to what was known as the Metropole, who would then use these agricultural and primary goods to uh, generate or manufacture items, which were then shipped back to the island. So in order to, within that system, the enslavement of Africans would emerge within that system to, to constitute the labor force in this mercantilist system on the island. Now, what distinguishes the French system from, let's say, the British system as we would find it in North America, as well as the Spanish system, is that the French, number one, they did not make any sort of distinction as to the, the Africans that were imported into the colony of Saint-Domingue. So they, they didn't discriminate whether they were Mandingo, Ashanti. They didn't discriminate tribally what Africans they enslaved and, and, and brought over to the colony. Whereas the, the, the British, the American colonies under British rule, they did, they made the distinction. They would actually uh, go on to the continent of Africa and select the type of Africans they needed for their plantation. Whether or not the African were, came from an agricultural society, uh, they, the, 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 the British colonies, they veered away from uh, uh, what they would call brutal Africans, warrior Africans. That's the first point of distinction. The second point of distinction, in the French colonies, the French had, they did not breed, they, the French did not breed the Africans as the British and the Spanish would. 
not only was the enslavement of Africans in the French colony one of the most brutal form of enslavement, but typically the, the enslaved African didn't live past uh, six months upon arrival on the uh, island. So they were, the minute an African died, they were simply replaced with more imported Africans, whereas on the African colony you had what's called chattel slavery, uh, uh, where uh, on the British as well in, in uh, Santo Domingo, where you know the Africans were uh, uh, bred on the uh, um, the British colonies as well as the uh, and the Spanish colonies. So therefore, there was constant replacement of Africans on the on the island of Hispaniola by the French, especially on the western side. And as a result of that, Haiti would become. A, a, a powder keg for revolution. What emerged on the island, on, on the western side, on the colony of Saint Domingue, is a division that was enforced by the French strictly by law. What was called the the the, the black codes, uh, the Napoleonic black codes on the uh, um, in the colony. So, because the Africans were imported. They were, there was strict division made by the French between the Africans who were imported into the uh, um, colony, the mulattoes who were a result of, uh, uh, because the men, the French men outnumbered the, the, the women on the colony. So French men uh, uh, would interbreed with uh, Africans. And you had a class of mulattoes that would emerge on the island, uh, on the, uh, in the colony. And then you also had what were called Creoles. These were Africans who were born on the colony and yet they were enslaved and they were kept separate from the mulattoes, the mulattoes who would be, who would be, who would own land as well on the, on, 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 in the colony. So you have a division between the Africans who were born in Africa who were called both sides on the continent, uh, uh, um, in the colony. You have the white Frenchmen, uh, land-owning Frenchmen. You had the mulatto elites, and you had a, a group of Creole Blacks, although Africans were born on the continent. Now, many of you may not notice that Haiti is the first and only successful revolution in recorded history. And the reason why, one of the reasons why the Africans were able to gain their independence, as I mentioned earlier, the French did not make the distinction between the Africans that were imported into the colony. So many of the Africans imported into the colony on the Western side were actually prisoners of war from the Congo region of the continent of Africa. So the Haitian Revolution begins August 14, 1791, at what, what is called a voodoo ceremony, a petro voodoo ceremony at a place called Bois Caïma, under the leadership of a Muslim imam by the name of Duty Bookman. Now, it's important to understand this. When the revolution commences in 1791, 67% of the population of the colony were directly from Africa. They were, they, they were not Creole Blacks, they were not mulattoes, they were not free. 67% of the population of about 500,000 were directly from Africa. And as a result, unlike the British colonies in which uh, 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 African practices were outrightly rejected and, and, and uh, litigated against, legislated against. The majority of the Africans maintained what is a way of life. Although contemporarily people want to refer to Vodou as a religion, it is not a, re a religion for Vodouism who are Voodoo pra uh, uh, practitioners. Vodou is a way of life. It is the first form of science among the Africans on the African continent. And it's, it's, it's tantamount to Shintoism and Hinduism. In Vodou, it is a way of life that explains the origins of the universe. 
it explains not only the origins of the universe, but it also has an ontology. It tells you what is the universe made of. It has an epistemology. It tells you that rationalism and empiricism are not the only way that we know what we know. Revelation, dreams, near-death experiences are also means by which we can ascertain truth. So unlike the West, in Vodou, there is not a distinction between phenomenon and noumenon. Remember, phenomenon refers to how things appear to consciousness in the material world. Noumena is how things are in and of themselves. In Haitian Vodou, which is, comes from Fon, the Fon tradition on the Western coast of Africa, the understanding is that you can also know noumena, the things as they are in and of themselves. And we know things how they are in and of themselves through dreams, through revelations, through uh, uh, near-death experiences, uh, through prognostications. So when the revolution commences, majority of the Africans, as I previously mentioned, held on to their voodoo traditions. In fact, there is two forms of system and social integration that would emerge on, in the colony. You have the Creole Blacks, although they were uh, Africans born on the island, they were indoctrinated in the Catholic ideology of the French. So you have uh, the, the, what I call in my book, the Voodoo Ethic and the Spirit of Communism. You have the French, the mulatto elites, and the, the, the Creole Blacks who want to integrate into the French Catholic mercantilist system and then you have the Africans who constituted 67% of the population who in, constituted their own form of system and social integration based on the way of life that would be known, that would come to be known as Vodou. And in that system, what they wanted, what they wanted to establish on the island was what's called the Laku system. It is a form of co communitarianism in which uh, 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 Lakus or villages are own, are under the control of a Wongun, what is known as a Wongun, which is a voodoo priest. And that priest controls social relations within what's called the Laku. It's a community of families who gather together to form a community and they share everything. It is, it is a, 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 what I call a form of libertarian communism on it. So as a result, what would emerge on the island is that when the Haitian Revolution commences in 1791, are three revolutions. You have the African Revolution, in which they're attempting to maintain the voodoo ethic and the spirit of communism uh, uh, on the, in the colony. You have the mulattoes who want to maintain the French mercantilist system. And then you have the Creole Blacks who want to do the same, but uh, without uh, 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 without slavery, so the each group would have their own leadership uh, uh, during the revolution. So you have, for example, many of you, if you know anything about the Haitian Revolution, the Creole Blacks were known were led by Toussaint Louverture, Jean Jacques Dessalines, uh, uh, Francois Capua Lamour, and as well as Henri Christophe. In fact, we call the, uh, uh, in Haitian historiography, they're known as uh, the, the pantheon of the uh, Haitian revolution. They represented the Creole black leadership on, in the colony. And you have your mulatto elites who had their own leadership. You had Alexander Pétion, Boyer, uh, uh, Rigaud, and they had their own leadership. Now, the distinction between the mulattoes and the, the, the Creole blacks the Creole Blacks, they want to maintain the mercantilist system, but without slavery. In fact, Toussaint, who would become the leader of the revolution, introduced something called the Corvée system. It just abolishes slavery, but maintains the plantocracy on the, in the colony. The, the mulatto elites, on the contrary, they wanted to maintain the mercantilist system as well as slavery. So even though in some Haitian historiography, we will include some of the mulatto leadership as part of the, uh, the heroes of the independence. 
I know that to some extent they were they were very treacherous. They wanted to maintain uh, um, the mercantilist system as well as the land they inherited from their French fathers without uh, with slavery. Whereas the Creole blacks wanted to maintain the mercantilist system without slavery under what they would call the poor pay system. The Africans who constituted 67% of the population want, wanted nothing to do with that type of system. In fact, they wanted to institute, constitute uh, uh, the uh, institute the voodoo ethic and the spirit of communism on the entire island. So they had their own leadership, Makaya, Sun Tzu Si, uh, uh, in fact, we date the revolution with the Africans at this voodoo ceremony called Bwakai Monk. Now, this historiography is very important because what would emerge post the revolution is, the, is that there is a struggle between these three groups on the island since 1804 when Haiti was declared not a republic. Many people get that wrong. Haiti was not declared a republic. When Jean-Jacques Dessalines declares independence from France and, the, and ends the revolution in 1804, uh, uh, January 1st, 1804, which is every January we celebrate Independence Day. On the contrary, it was it was it was an empire. He 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 he, uh, uh, he claimed Haiti to be the first black empire in the world. So, and it was open to all blacks wherever you were. Uh, it would be a a a a a, 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 a beacon for all blacks, um, not only in the Western Hemisphere but all throughout the world at the time. So, since 1804, these three groups have been in their form of system and social integration have dominated Haiti since 1804 to contemporary times. In fact, there is a constant struggle between the Africans because. Post 1804, the emperor Jean Jacques Dessalines would uh, uh, he would be assassinated by the mulatto uh, elite by the name of uh, Alexander Pétion, who Napoleon sent back uh, to reclaim the island for France. So, and in fact, it is Alexander Pétion who would institute uh, the republic in on uh, the the Haitian political scene. So. From 1806, with the death of Dessalines, majority of the Africans in what would become Haiti, and Haiti is a Tayano name, which means land of mountains. Um, so when Dessalines declares Haiti, not Saint-Domingue, it was Saint-Domingue under French rule, an independent empire, he struggled between instituting the mercantilist system on the island versus instituting the Laku system of the majority of the Africans. Remember, the Laku system is a communitarian form of social relation that emerges out of the Buddha way of life uh, among the Africans. And the majority of the Africans on the island came from two places in Africa, the Congo region, as well as the, the Benin region of West Africa. So the Congo region, region of Central Africa and the Benin region of West Africa. So within that voodoo system, and a, another misnomer that we'll get to that is being clarified amongst voodoo practitioners contemporarily, uh, uh, we, um, voodoo is not a syncretic religion, meaning it's not a synthesis between Christianity, African traditional animism, absolutely not. In fact, there is a movement to move away from that understanding about uh, uh, the voodoo ethos. So when the mulatto elite, Alexander Pétion, assassinates the founder of the country in 1801, I'm sorry, in 1804, the majority of the Africans who this Ali was fighting for, because there's the strife between whether or not the side with the mulattoes and the Creole Blacks and institute this mercantilist system or to allow the Africans to institute the Laku system on the island, what uh, sociologist Jean Casimir called the counterplantation system. I don't adopt uh, uh, that name for him. Anyway, by the time this island is assassinated, there is a strife that would emerge on the island and the, the, the country was divided into two countries. 
of the Northern uh, 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 Kingdom and the Southern Republic. And the majority of the Africans uh, migrated to the mountains and the provinces of the island. Now, this is very, very significant. Because what would emerge in Haiti from 1806 is a state apparatus that did not invest in education and did not provide a, a, a systemic form of social organization on the island. So the Africans were left to their own devices to institute and constitute their own form of system and social integration on the island. And what I argue, what they did was they, they established the Laku system in, in the mountains and provinces of, of the country, whereas the elites, being the mulatto elites and, and the, 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 the Creole Blacks would fight over the, the Republic in the Southern region. So this is very important because it is that strike beginning in 1806 that would dominate Haitian historiography, sociology, and political thought till contemporary times. In fact, um, the struggle in Haiti is between the mulatto elites and the Creole blacks over control over the state apparatus. The political uh, uh, apparatus becomes the means of wealth in the island. And this is done at the expense of the Africans who migrated to the provinces as well as into the mountains of the country. And in the provinces and in the mountains of the country, it instituted the voodoo ethic and the spirit of communism. And out of voodoo, their whole way of life was based on the ontology, and ontology deals with the study of being, the ontology, the epistemology, and the ethics of Wodu. And this is where the science of the people would emerge. So out of Wodu, you have an epistemology that says, one, we can know the noumenal world through revelation, and in that world, what they argue is that the world is not one universe, but the world is a multiverse. And this multiverse being, and they call this being God, because in their mind, there's no other word to express the being that created this world out of itself. So this being, bon Dieu, bon Dieu, bon, bon Dieu created the multiverse out of itself. And bon Dieu used concepts and mathematics to create this world and the aim or the ethical way of life should be maintaining a balance between the individual, the society, and the world that was created out of Bon Dieu, all of which are one. So out of Bon Dieu, the multiverse was created. And because we cannot know the mind of Bon Dieu, the mind of God, he gave us concepts and mathematics to allow us to know the mind of God or to get as close to God as possible. Now, these concepts and mathematics in Haitian Vodou are called loas. They are loas. The loas are concepts and mathemat mathematical principles by which we ought to recursively reorganize and reproduce our lives in the world to maintain balance between the individual, society, and the universe. All are interconnected. So in Vodou, there are 401 laws or concepts of mathematics. 400 being 400 concepts that God utilized to create the multiverse and the one being God itself. So each each of these concepts are represented by a symbol. And I sent uh, Gloria the symbol that she can share that with you all. There's three symbols. Um, I, I use three examples. There's three symbols and they're called laws. These symbols represent the symbol of Esli Duntal. The first okay, symbol, I'm, which is, the, I'm sorry, Gloria. Uh, let, me, let me just, I was just sending something about okay. to talk to someone. It's taking a second to send here. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. So you want to advance them. Let me make the, sure. The first right. symbol is uh, seven on your slide. Okay. Seven on my slide. Yes. Can you each, see that now? So uh, can everyone see that? So each symbol represents a concept 
that Bon Dieu or God utilized to create the multiverse. The symbol that you're looking at on the screen now is the symbol of uh, Ezeli Duntal. Now, this is very important because remember, I stated earlier that the Haitian Revolution begins on August 14, 1791, at a voodoo ceremony, a petrol voodoo ceremony called Bois near at a place called Bois under the leadership of Duty Bookman, who was an imam, uh, 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 um, a Muslim. Now, in Vodou, the understanding is that not only are the math, uh, uh, that God created these mathematical principles and concepts by which we are to recursively reorganize organ organ and reproduce our existence in the world, but we as human beings can also utilize these mathematical principles and concepts to, to for, uh, uh, for liberation, uh, on how to love, how to live in the material world. And this symbol is the symbol for motherhood as well as vengeance, motherhood and vengeance. It represents the loi Esli Duntal, who is the goddess of the Haitian nation. Now, the, under, the belief is in Haitian folklore is that during this ceremony of Bwakai Mung, the uh, duty bookman called on God to help us fight against the French uh, uh, um, in order to liberate ourselves from the brutality of French uh, enslavement. And the understanding is that as we actually descended from the heavens, embodied uh, a woman that was represented at the ceremony, her name is Cecile Fatima, and she led the Haitians uh, during the rebellious period. There's a rebellious period that dates from 1791 all the way to 1804. At the ceremony, it was also, the, the leaders of the revolution was also prognosticated by uh, um, Cecile Fatima, who was embodied by Esme Dantal, who dictated to the Haitians how the revolution would unfold, who the leaders of the revolution would be, and who would eventually lead them to total independence from the French. So as these, these are called Veve and Vodou, they represent mathematical principles and concepts. So this concept is of Esme Duntal, and she represents the goddess of vengeance of motherhood and Vodou. The next slide is slide eight, and that is the Veve of Esme Duntal's, and just an aside, Esme Duntal also assisted God in the creation of uh, uh, the multiverse as well. So it is out of her womb that the multiverse was created. So we are all children of Esme Duntal. Now, when you view Re Vodou as a religion, as a syncretic religion, which is synthesized with Catholicism, many people associate as we done call with, with, with the Virgin Mary. But there's a movement away from that contemporarily in Haiti, away from identifying Vodou, number one, as a religion, number two, as a syncretic religion in which uh, uh, um, um, uh, Western symbols were incorporated in it to, to help the Africans uh, um, experience their religiosity. There's a total move away from that. The second symbol is of Esli Freda. This is the symbol of love. Freda is the goddess of love in Haitian yeah. Vodou. Do you want me to go, excuse me, do you want me to advance or? No, 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 you can stay at, on, oh, this stay on this one. Okay. Yeah, yes, please. Okay. So many of the mulatto elites uh, uh, would adopt her veve to represent them because the understanding in Haitian Vodou, Esli Frida is a mulatress. Yeah, uh, um, and she represents love and beauty as well as wealth uh, uh, in Haitian Vodou. Now remember, love, wealth, beauty, these are concepts in Vodou, but they're represented by veves. Uh, they are real. Uh, um, they're, they're, some people will actually worship as we free that as a goddess uh, or appeal to her. Because in Haitian Vodou, the understanding is that consciousness does not die. We, we are reincarnated 
16 times, eight times as a woman and eight times as a man. And so therefore, many of these concepts, as well as these mathematical principles, were represented by people who actually lived in the material world or experienced the material world, have gone on to the world of the ancestors, and they themselves have become laws because they were great beings who embody these concepts when they were alive. But they're tantamount to Platonic forms. If anybody knows the history of Plato, uh, Western philosophy, and Plato makes the distinction between forms, concepts of beauty or Platonic forms that exist in a separate realm, or do assume that argument as well, that it, there is a separate realm. And I will get into that when I get into how I use uh, Vodou contemporarily in my, my, uh, in my research in physics and philosophy. The next Vevet, Vevet number nine, is actually the Vevet of uh, Dessalines, who is the founder of the, uh, uh, the Haitian country. Uh, Dessalines and Vodou, because he embodied what would become this concept represent political warfare, political warriors. Those statesmen, great statesmen. So this Ali, because he was such a great political warrior and a great statesman, he, upon his assassination, he became what is known as a loi in Vodou. And, and he is the he is represented by the loi Ogu. So this symbol represents this vevet represents Ogu. In this case, a particular variation of Vodou, there's um, uh, of Ogu. Uh, very, uh, uh, there are several versions of Ogu and Vodou. Vodou uh, Ogu can be a political warrior, a, a statesman, but it, it is represented by a warrior in general. Uh, and each symbol or concept also are represented by colors as well. So Ogu, uh, uh, the first two, as we done taught, is her colors are red and blue. Uh, as we free die, her colors are, are um, uh, pink, pink and white. Ogu, his colors are red and black. And interestingly enough, that is technically supposed to be the, the flag of Haiti. When this Aline declares Haiti an empire, he also states that the flag should always be red and black. The mulatto elites would introduce uh, uh, the blue and red flag on, on, uh, of the island, but uh, the voodoo community does not uh, 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 identify with that flag. They identify with the black and red flag of uh, um, Dessalines. Now, remember, so Vodou as a way of life is an ethos with its own ontology, its own epistemology, and its own ethical uh, 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 or what we call axiology. And the axiology, and axiology simply refers to art and ethics and, and philosophy. So the art and the ethics in Vodou are represented by Vevet. The Vevets help us maintain, and the, the, the symbols I just showed you all are Vevets. They help us to understand the concepts by which we ought to live and maintain balance between ourselves, our communities, and the universe. So beauty, ought to be balanced by ugliness. There's no right, morally there, are, there is no right and wrong in Vodou. The aim is balance and harmony between nature, the universe, our communities, and the individual. So that is the form of system and in, in social integration that would dominate the provinces and the mountains of the island. And to be fair, the mulatto elites as well as the Creole Blacks have been attempting to eradicate uh, uh, for do on the and its way of life on the island since independence, there was a, 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 an embracement of Vodou, uh during the 1940s and 1950s by many of you may know Papa Doc Duvalier, Francois Duvalier, who declared himself dictator for life on the island in the 19 uh, beginning in the 1950s. He would die in the uh, uh, 70s, and his son, Baby Doc, would assume. So what Papa Doc did was he identified himself with the concept of death, known as Gede, by Wong Samji, who is the leader of what's called Gede. These are the Veves, or the laws of death in Vodou. And they are feared. And they, the, what, what is 
and I'll get to this. The, what is you, because Vodou emphasizes balance and harmony, death is not to be feared, but to be embraced. And what Papa Doc did in the 1950s, he tried to instill fear in the population by identifying himself with the vevet of death, uh, uh, who is, and he's, he's known as Awu Samji in Haitian Vodou. And this is how many argue he was able to maintain uh, uh, um, uh, his rule on the island. Nonetheless, so as a way of life and this, the, 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 the emphasis with balance and harmony in nature, what would emerge on the island post-revolution and contemporarily is this fight between what the mulatto elites and the Creole Blacks in control of the state apparatus, what they would do is they would consider Haitian Vodou and all of the mysticism associated with Vodou as folklore. So beginning in the 1940s, there was an attempt to attract tourism on the island. And because there was a fear of Vodou, what the elites attempted to do was to incorporate Vodou as folklore within uh, the Haitian state. So this is the image, and, and this dates back to the U.S. occupation. Haiti was occupied by the U.S. from 1915 and 1934. And under this occupation, there was an, uh, when the Americans arrived, there was an attempt to eradicate Vodou, eventually, the Vodou that the Americans would take out of Haiti to the Western world is what you see in the media about Vodou, Vodou dolls, uh, uh, all of the uh, zombies, all of the, the, the this folklorish element of Vodou. They took uh, uh, um, Vodou as a way of life and bastardized it, essentially. And this bastardization of Vodou would continue under the elites that American that the American occupiers put in place to replace the, the, the Marines who would occupy the island. So the elites then they euphemized Vodou and tried to incorporate it into uh, the tourist industry for uh, from the 1940s to up until about the 1980s. Uh, I would say up until about 1990 when. It, when John Pitman Aristide would become uh, the first democratically elected president. And when he does, he incorporated Vodou into Haiti as a religion. And he also incorporated the science of Vodou. Now, so there's this fight to separate the folklorish element that the elite would try to synthesize uh, uh, or, or to uh, um, uh, uh, incorporate Vodou into the state apparatus and the science and the way of life of Vodou that jean Bertrand Aristide and many of the Vodou practitioners would attempt to incorporate. So for example, there, uh, Vodou, uh, the uh, Vodouisan, the leaders of the Haitian uh, uh, Vodou uh, uh, population, what they would go about doing is to organize themselves under uh, uh, what's called KN. KNVA. So what they've done is they've organized themselves. They have a science uh, a component. Um, and because Vodou is heavily, the emphasis is on herbal medicine, uh, maintaining the balance between the body and the universe. Uh, you have people, the first leader of the community, um, Max Beauvoir, he's known as DIT. He passed away some years ago. He would also start in Max earned a PhD from the Sabon uh, in biochemistry. Um, and as a vac Vodou practitioner, what he began to do is to demystify uh, Vodou. So his emphasis uh, throughout the span of his life has been to catalog, uh, catalog uh, the herbal medicine that are utilized in Vodou uh, uh, ceremonies. Um, uh, the plants that are used in herbal medicine in Vodou, similar to what the Chinese would do uh, uh, um, with their herbal uh, uh, medicine. Uh, the other component um, 
that had there's this move also to uh, uh, de demystify the, the 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 Catholic elements in Vodou to to remove all of the Catholic elements to unidentify the lois or the veves with the the Catholic saints under slavery. Many of the enslaved Africans would identify the lois with uh, Catholic saints. For example, Esli Dantal and Esli Frida were associated with the Virgin Mary. Um, Papa, uh, Papa Legba was identified with St. Patrick, uh, and Legba is the god, god of wisdom, the heaven of wisdom. He was identified with uh, St. Patrick. So there's contemporarily, there is a move to not only demystify Vodou, to remove the Catholic elements in Vodou, to also remove the folklorish elements of Vodou that the elites attempted to do uh, through the tourism industry. For example, um, uh, the, in the folklorish side, um, what you would find when tourists would visit the island, uh, the elites who would own majority of the hotels on the island, they would incorporate folklorish dancing um, where uh, they would have um, voodoo practitioners dance on glass, eating fire, all of the negative stereotypes that the, the occupiers would bring to the West, they would show uh, 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 zombies at these uh, uh, at these hotels. So there's a movement for that. And I wanted to address the zombification because many people associate, especially with Wade Davis. I don't know if, if you all of, of the generation, uh, um, Wade Davis was a, a Harvard-trained anthropologist who visited Haiti uh, in the 1980s, and he wrote a book called The Serpent and the Rainbow, which would become a popular movie in the 80s. And what he did was he tried to capture, to, to be fair to him, I, I will try to be fair as fair as possible to, to him, he tries to capture the culture of Vodou on the island, but what came out was this fear that Haiti was filled with, with voodoo priests who were zombifying the population. And zombification in voodoo is, is what we call, it, it, is, a, it, is a penal, it, 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 it has penal significance. What does that mean? Well, in voodoo, we have what's called the Petro tradition and the Lada tradition. These two traditions balance each other out. The, the, the Rada tradition represents uh, the beauty, the, the, the good spirits or the good concepts that would, and I hate to use good because there's no uh, moral uh, 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 significance behind them. Um, but they represent beauty, love, the, the concepts that God used to create the universe. The Petro tradition emphasized that element that balances the, 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 the concepts of creation. So therefore, Gede, uh, the goddess of death, as we don't the goddess of revenge, they represent the, 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 uh, um, that element that helps to balance the, the, uh, uh, the good concept. I'll use good just uh, for those who to have a good understanding. So there is this, the zombification element constitutes the petrol tradition. It is the petrol tradition have their own secret societies that are in place to maintain law and order within the community. So therefore, zombification is a sort of punishment for any transgression against the community. And since the, the taking of life is considered problematic, in Vodou, one is not allowed to take life, life of any sort, without uh, 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 any sort of sacrifice. And because of that, zombification is used to punish those who transgress against the laws of the community. But that's not what came out of the movie, The Serpent of the Rainbow. What came out was, this was the perversity of Vodou. 
this zombification in which Wade Davis himself almost became zombified uh, while he was doing his research on the island. But anyway, there's a chemical process that's in place behind uh, uh, um, uh, zombification. And the move, scientific movement contemporarily in Haiti has been to map out the science behind the herbal medicine that goes into zombification. So these are the movements we find scientifically in Haiti contemporarily. There is a movement to rid itself of the folklorish element that the, began with the Americans and that the, the mulatto elites in the, what we call the black bourgeoisie contemporarily on the island would use to build up the tourist industry on the island. So there is a move away from this folklorish element. There is also a move away from demystifying voodoo, away from the Catholic symbolism that would be incorporated into voodoo to hid uh, uh, the, uh, or to protect the practitioners under slavery. And that movement is, is, is taking the form of ridding not only of voodoo of the Catholic saints, but also uh, uh, re-symbolizing or re-articulating the, 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 the laws. For example, if Gloria can go to slide five and six for me, let's start with with five, this is what's happening. And now this is what's happening amongst Haitian Americans um, in America. There's this move to take not only the leaders of the Haitian revolution, but the laws or the concepts of creation themselves and turn them into superheroes. So Makandal, which is represented uh, uh, in this slide here, is actually a hero of the Haitian Revolution who's now become in the popular culture in the Haitian American community has become a superhero. Makandal was killed by the French in 1758. Uh, and he was also a, 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 an imam priest who um, led the revolution, who, who, who started a rebellion on the island. He prognosticated the revolution of 1791 and the founding of the Haitian state in 1804. The understanding is, uh, and, and Haitian folklore is that he more that he was captured by the French. He more, uh, metamorphosized himself into a butterfly and escaped uh, uh, be, because the French tried to burn him alive. And it is the belief is he metamorphosized into a butterfly and flew off. And now, contemporarily in the Haitian American community, there is a move to take Mockendahl and turn him into a superhero, a black superhero. And that is a movement that is also occurring, not in the superhero element, but on the island of Haiti, there is a move now to Africanize um, the Vevez. So demystify him away from Catholicism and to re-Africanize them, give them all, uh, alternate images. And that is also happening in the African-American, I'm sorry, in the Haitian-American community as well. If uh, Gloria can go to slide six for me, please. That this is also, uh, this is the first chapter. Now they, they have comics around these superheroes. And this one particular comic is known as Makandal. And it, it, it speaks to how Makandal is a hero and he's able to uh, uh, metamorphosize into the other, the, the first image that I showed you all, uh, image five. So that is what's happening contemporarily, uh, um, not only in Haiti, but also in the Haitian American community. So lastly, there is the, and I spoke to you about Max Beauvoir and this attempt to uh, demystify the herbs associated with herbal medicine in um, the voodoo, uh, uh, in the voodoo, voodoo community, that's very important because the state apparatus in Haiti, under the control of the Malawi police and the petty black bourgeoisie in Haiti, they rarely penetrated the mountains and the provinces with hospitals or schools. So basically, if you were born in Haiti, in the mountains, or in the provinces outside of the capital. Nine times out of 10, the only time you visited 
any sort of doctor was a a a a a, a or a balka. A balka is someone who deals with the black magic side of Vodou, uh, the magical elements of Vodou. And I was born on the island. I left the island when I was six. And my first, I, I have sickle cell anemia, but it, I never visited the uh, a hospital when I was in Haiti. I was born in a, a, a coastal town called Oboy, which is uh, about 25 miles outside of Cap Haitian, Ocop, which is the second major city uh, of Haiti. And um, my only visit were to a uh, Wonga, and I, it, anytime I was sick, I, it was through herbal medicine that um, uh, I was cured. So there is this move now in Haiti to cat, catalog as well as categorize uh, the herbs that are involved in what we use, what are used to zombify individuals who transgress society herbal medicines that are used for stomach aches, whatever the element may be, there's this move towards that. Now, in my own research, how I deal with voodoo, I also am moving towards a, a, a the demystification of voodoo as well. And by that, I mean, I use voodoo to uh, uh, its ontology and its epistemology to understand the study of consciousness from a uh, from the standpoint of physics, so that's my area of research. Um, I, uh, I developed this theory called consciousness field theory, which is which constitute part of my larger theory of phenomenological structuralism. And what I'm attempting to do is to understand uh, uh, the emergence of the multiverse and how it's articulated in Vodou and marry that with contemporary quantum mechanics to understand the nature of consciousness. And if many of you are familiar with that field, you know, contemporarily we make the distinction between a materialist understanding of consciousness in which uh, many argue that the people like Daniel Bennett, they argue that consciousness uh, is uh, it's an illusion. It's only an epiphenomenon of the uh, material brain, what we call the neural correlates of consciousness. So the brain generates consciousness. Uh, it, it, conversely, you have the post-materialist people who are located, uh, the majority of them are actually in Arizona. <laughs> and they argue that, no, the brain facilitates consciousness. So consciousness emerges somewhere, either what we call panpsychism, in which consciousness is in everything and simply emerges and the brain facilitates uh, that emergent consciousness, or they introduce what's called cosmopsychism, in which consciousness either comes from God and spiritism or comes from what is called the absolute vacuum. Well, I attempt to marry what Vodou says about the origins of consciousness and the multiverse with quantum mechanics in which I argue that consciousness uh, emerges from what, what I call the absolute vacuum. Um, and from there, the brain facilitates consciousness. And this is where the initial book, Patient Epistemology, comes from. For me, in order to get to that level, I had to outline the not only the ontology of Vodou, but also the epistemology of Vodou. And in doing so, what I did was I began by outlining that. And from there, I demystify. I remove those elements which I believe have been refuted by Western science and, and maintain those aspects that have yet to be refuted. For example, in my research, I hold on to the multiverse concept because that has yet to be disproved by Western science. In fact, you have many physicists who hold on to the notion that Hugh Everett, for example, who coined uh, 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 the term of multiverse, um, many other physicists hold on to this notion that we live in a multiverse. So I hold on to that aspect of Vodou. I also hold on to that aspect of Vodou that says, which says that consciousness is never, uh, 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 does not die and perpetuates. Um, 
I've even held on to the notion of reincarnation. Which not only uh, we find not not only do we find the concept of reincarnation in Vodou, but we also find it in Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Shintoism. Um, well, however, I do not believe that uh, we are reincarnated in the form of animals or anything like that. I do believe the form we were were, were reincarnated in the same form. And then to do so, I hold on to concepts in physics such as uh, uh, juxtaposition, I'm sorry, superposition, uh, uh, um, uh, complement parity. I hold on to that concept as well. I hold on to the concept as mentioned, previously mentioned of the multiverse. And that I attempt to marry that to get to this notion, to my notion of consciousness field theory and which I argue that the brain facilitates consciousness and consciousness does not die. So there's tremendous work that can come out of the voodoo community that is coming out of the voodoo community in Haiti. And as we start, as the elites start to embrace that, I think that will take Haiti to another future. There's so much we can get out of voodoo, just like Einstein and Schopenhauer and many others relied on Hinduism to get us to general relativity, I also believe that Vodou can take us to that next step in physics to not only understand consciousness, but also to understand the multiverse. So lastly, there is this push because what would happen on the island post-independence is that the African majority that would go into the provinces and the mountains of the island also develop their own language, which is the language of Creole. Creole was discriminated against by the mulatto elites as well as the, the, black, the Creole Blacks on the island. And it's not until the 1980s do we start to incorporate Creole as the language of instruction in the school system. And even now, it's still a struggle. Uh, my wife and I have recently finished a book on the grammar of Creole, which was adopted by the, the Haitian Academy of Creole from the island. And the, the purpose behind that is to use Creole to teach physics and mathematics uh, 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 as the language of instruction in the school system. And as it, uh, uh, an aside to that as well, my work also includes um, highlighting the form of system and social integration that would emerge out of Vodou. Uh, and um, uh, if, 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 Car if Gloria may use that last slide for me, which is the title of my, my last book, The Voodoo Ethic in the Spirit of Communism, um, what I've done in that book is to highlight the, 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 the form of system and social integration that would emerge out of the Laku system associated with Vodou, and I call it a form of libertarian communism. And the aim for me is that's the form of system and social integration. Uh, I universalize it as the form of system and social integration that we should utilize or we should move towards if we are to salvage humanity from um, climate change, which, is, uh, uh, which will eventually impact the entire globe. So I, what I argue is that if we go back and look at the form of system and social integration that the Africans on the continent, as well as in Haiti, would incorporate or constitute uh, to recursively organize and reproduce the material resource framework, that form of system and, and social integration can salvage us from the impending doom that we're facing with climate change. So we, it's not the traditionalism that we see or the, the neo-fascism that we see emerging in, in, as a uh, Polanian counter-hegemonic uh, um, form to neoliberal globalization or neoliberalism. But I argue we need to emphasize the libertarian uh, uh, communism that was practiced in Africa and as well as in the mountains and provinces of, of Haiti. So that's how I'm utilizing my work now. So on that note, I will end. If you all have any questions, I will take them. Uh, thanks again, Gloria, for having me. I hope oh, I enlighten people. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, Professor McComb. And uh, I see we have seven chat things. I have a little problem sometimes opening yes. my chat. So uh, why don't, can you see the chat icon, Professor yes. McComb? Maybe yes. you could start to answer those. I, I could try to open it, but sometimes it screws up my screen. I don't know why. Okay. I don't know if any of those are questions because I can't see them. I see yeah. what Bruce says. I did not know yeah. about the successful revolution. <laughs> yes, it was. It was the <laughs> only successful slave revolution in recorded history. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. When you read the revolution, it's brilliant. It's just brilliant how, you know, they defeated not only the French, but also the British, the Spanish, as well as the Americans who were selling guns to the, uh, the French as well. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so I, I wanted I wanted to ask um, mm -hmm. in the, you know in the long history of Haiti um, were there indigenous uh, communities on the island as well and uh... yes uh, are you yes there were the Tiano natives occupied the island prior to the advent of the 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 uh, the Europeans now there's some debates in Haitian historiography. Uh, between whether or not by the time the Africans arrived on the island, whether or not the, the, the natives were completely wiped out. Some historians argue that they were, others do not. But in Vaudoux, elements of the Tiano traditions were incorporated into the Vaudoux tradition. For example, uh, in Vaudoux, the understanding is that the black and red flag represents the Tiano tradition there are also the secret societies of Vodou also represent uh, the Tiano tradition. For example, uh, Saint Puel, which are uh, they are they are Saint Puel Bizango. These are the police force in Vodou. They protect the society from transgression. Some will argue that they represent the Tiano tradition of Vodou. Other historians argue that they're they're they're, they're still Congolese tradition. Um, so it all depends on where you fall, but. May, there are many elements in Vodou that the Vodou tradition claim uh, uh, comes from the Tiano tradition. Domification is believed come from the Tiano tradition as well. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. There, there's a, so much, so much, so many strands. Absolutely, absolutely. And then the, what, what's sad about not only the history but the sociology and the culture uh, um, dating because. What well, people fail to realize that the mulatto elites were actually left the island. They, they were defeated in 1801 by Jean-Jacques de Salines and was called the War of Knives. They were removed from the island. And when Napoleon finished, consolidated his power in Europe, he actually sent the mulattoes to return to the island to capture the island for uh, France. So in doing so, um, they were losing the mulattoes, as well as Napoleon's soldiers, were losing the war. But many of the Creole Black generals had capitulated to General Leclerc when he returned in 1801 to recapture the island. And when they realized that the Africans were winning, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was a Creole Black, he formed a pact between himself and the mulatto leadership, Alexander Pétion, to actually prevent the Africans from capturing the island. Oh. And this is why with his death, the Africans went um, into the mountains and provinces. And that's the, and if you look at Haiti contemporarily, it is divided between the, the majority of the Africans in the mountains and provinces, the mulatto elites uh, um, who control <coughs> the state apparatus, as well as the, the petty bourgeois blacks who are fighting to, because they became large landowners. Those two groups, the mulatto elites okay. and the, the Creole Blacks became landowners on the island post-independence. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thank, thank you. Um, I have to run now, but thanks again for joining us and, uh, and wonderful presentation. And uh, we'll, we'll be doing a little extra reading this summer. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I think this is this gives us some real strands to bring into science fiction. I tried to search what already has been done in science fiction with voodoo. I did a you know word search between voodoo and science fiction, and there was a novel by Andre Norton 
from maybe the 1940s, but it looks yes. very, very, did you, do you also know that novel? Uh, yes, yes. It and there's very, also uh, Jacques Romain wrote a novel mm -hmm. uh, um, um, in the 1950s, who was, he was a Marxist, um, um, a Haitian elite. And um, mm -hmm. he also did some work. Now we, we've we corrected the spelling too. I saw when you were doing your search, you typed in V-O-O-D-O-O. -O -O. Oh, we, yes, right, right. We, we don't spell it that way anymore. Oh. It's spelled V-O-D-U. Okay. D-O-U, I'm sorry, V-O-D-O-U. Right, oh. And this was, I, this I was have, past. I must have shown that on my screen. I didn't know. Yes, I saw that on that. your screen. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, and and, and B-O-O-B-O-O -B -O -O is usually associated with New Orleans voodoo and hoodoo. Oh, There's some connection because remember, that area was, -O -O was owned by the French. So, so if we should search that, does anything more? Let me see if anything more. Yeah, there's, up, there's more. There's a it. professor, uh, Selucent, uh Joseph, here in Florida, who's working on voodoo as well. Um, uh, Dante's Balaguer, he's doing work. Uh, you have other voodoo practitioners who are starting to publish their own work on voodoo as well. So mm -hmm. yes, there, there's there, so, there's a there's a there's an especially post the earthquake. There's been a move uh, not only among Haitian Americans but also on the, on the island to reach back to um, the voodoo tradition to help rebuild Haiti. I don't know how long that's going to last because there's just oh, constant struggle. Unfortunately, I see that ASU has a has a writer that seems to be doing the old kind of caricature. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. But the focus, the focus there is usually on uh, New Orleans, Mar oh, Marie okay. Laveau, and all of that. That's usually on New Orleans vo voodoo. Now here, the Science Fiction Re uh, Writers Association does seem to know it has two spellings and they're, yes, they're trying yes. to show how it has been used, maybe both kinds here. So yes, and there's also this, this distinction as well into separating the two to make sure that we show the distinction between the two. I have one other question because yes. we're very familiar with Nettie, I hope I'm saying her name right, Okorafor. Mm -hmm. And Binti. Um, now she is from a Nigerian parentage, as I understand. Yes. And that may not be the parts of Africa where voodoo was uh, practiced. Yes, there is. The, the, the petrol tradition in voodoo comes from the Congolese region, what was known as the Congo back then, mm -hmm. of Nigeria. Yes, oh. absolutely. There's, there's tremendous. In fact, um, since the 1990s, there's been this relationship between Benin and Nigeria in the Haitian voodoo community. Once again, remember, there's this move to re-Africanize. In mm -hmm. fact, there is a move to have uh, uh, Haiti join the African Union. Right now, we did not pass, I think, four or five years ago, because the understanding is that Haiti is, um, Haiti is Africa and the Caribbean. As mm -hmm. I mentioned previously, when the Haitian Revolution commences, almost 70% of the population were directly from Africa. So when you want to look, if you want to do the, the, the transatlantic slave trade backwards, you would go from the U.S. to Haiti to Benin in the Congo region. I see, because Binti had strong, it sounded like voodoo yes, um, absolutely. elements in it. Absolutely. I, I, think from what I remember it's been several months since I read it the first time and I think Ab absolutely it. absolutely yeah. even when you read um uh, uh Chenua Achebe's things fall apart mm -hmm. it, when I read it when I was in undergrad it was as though I was reliving my childhood in Haiti I can identify many of the Nigerian the Laku system that was established the plasage plasage in Haiti is a form of polygamy in Haiti and the provinces in the mountains in which a man will have multiple women and, and live with them as though they're his wives. They're similar to uh, uh, what you see in Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart. I see. Well, this is, this is fascinating. So it's as if you're discovering 
uh, just like they do on Finding Your Roots with <laughs> Lewis Henry Gates. You know, yes. <laughs> uh, people just discover bits that were missing in their uh, jigsaw puzzle of their whole background. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a very good thing. And we all, you know, I think we all are trying to do this from our different positions. We start with wherever our little self and our family came from. And then we, we see all these gaps and it's wonderful to be now having this technology where we can get people together from, oh, and I was going to say, we haven't heard anything out of Ian. Oh, and he's, 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 been, he's over there in South Africa. Does he have any insight? Yes, I do. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, it seems to go around the concept of ID, identity, mm -hmm. um, and how it must be difficult for a Haitian to identify himself except to stand under the national flag. Would you agree with that uh, opinion? Uh, e yes and no, because the problem with Haiti is that the flag is so divisive in Haiti. The blue and red flag that we, that we celebrate on May 18th, which is Haitian Flag Day, um, is associated with the mulatto class on the island. And that class, and I don't know if many of you have seen the um, the New York Times did an expose on the indemnity clause that Haiti had to pay to France in order to recognize their independence. Uh, they paid up to almost 90 mil, 150 million francs to have their independence recognized. But what the what the Times articles omit is the fact that. The indemnity clause was not introduced by the French. It was introduced by the mulatto leadership. Alexander Pétion offered to pay this indemnity clause so that the French can recognize Haiti. However, the Creole Blacks were against that, as well as the, the Africans. And he was shamed, and he, he, he makes that initial request, I believe in 1817, and it's not until the death of Henri Christophe, who was a Creole general, does uh, is that request reintroduced by the second president of the republic, a, a man by the name of Boyer. He also suggested that Haiti pay this indemnity clause to France. Um, uh, uh, and so what he did then, he closed all the, the, the schools that were on the island and forced the Africans to go back onto the plantations to pay this indemnity clause. So the, the New York Times is writing a form of revisionist history. And so in doing so, they omit that there's this uh, ongoing strife between the, the, the Creole Blacks on the island, the mulatto elites and the Africans, and each have their own flags that they say represent Haiti. So the mulatto elites, we adopted the red and blue flag. And I don't know if you're old enough to remember when under Papa Doc, the flag of Haiti was black and red. However, when his son, uh, after the coup in 1986 and his son was, for, was forced into exile, the mulatto elites would regain control over the, the political apparatus and they would reintroduce the red and blue flag on the island. So the flag itself is divisive. And then when you go into this notion of identity, it's very important because in the 1950s, there was the debate, especially coming out of the French uh, um, colonies, this negritude movement, whether or not there was an authentic or an essentialist Black identity that Blacks could go or, or can retrieve or Blacks have that is distinct from white culture or white Western society. People like Franz Fanon were against that. When he writes his Black skin or white mask, it is a refutation of this negritude movement started in the French Martinique uh, colony by uh, M.S. Cesar. And he argues, no, there is no such thing as a Black essentialist identity. But Haiti is the only place really in the Caribbean that maintained uh, 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 an authentic African identity. Now, some will argue like the Afrocentrics in America says that there's an Afrocentric worldview. 
that it, it's no that, 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 that that's rubbish. Majority of African Americans, they, they, you, you know, there's there's this thing in anthro in anthropological circles about Africanism in American culture and, and African American culture, but that, that that the argument is essentialistic, and it, it, you, you know, many Black Americans, they if they don't want to admit it, they're Western. Haiti is one of the only places where there is a traditional African system that we practice. Thanks, Paul. And I'd also like to congratulate you on your presentation and perhaps even to mention that uh, I need to congratulate you on not using the word melting pot once in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I'd like to intersect what you've said with uh, the concepts of uh, science fiction writing. Mm -hmm. I see two opportunities here for science fiction writers. One perhaps is to write something like Haiti 3030, where one projects forward um, the effects of saccharine replacing sugar, um, global warming, uh, political events elsewhere in the world, and um, uh, incorporates this into a fantastic projection of to what Haiti is like uh, in the year 3030. Um, the other possibility is to steal ideas from uh, Haiti's history and to incorporate these uh, into formulating concepts which one uses to transplant people from Earth to, say, Mars. The people who travel to Mars and live on Mars in the future will be from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. They'll be from different nationalities, different cultures, different languages, and perhaps they'll even start up their own religions, their own uh, little churches, uh, their own political societies. Um, do you feel that that is a possibility? Absolutely. There's a there's a third possibility. Um, when Papa Doc, when I'm sorry, when Baby Doc fell in 1986, prior to him leaving the island, he he called on all of the voodoo priests on the island to prognosticate whether whether or not he should leave and what would happen to Haiti within the next 100 to 200 years. And now this is 1986. So it is, uh, there, there is a Haitian reporter who wrote about this meeting in which he actually outlined everything that the voodoo uh, uh, practitioners said to him. They prognosticated, it is claimed, uh, the Haiti earthquake of 2010. They prognosticated another devastating uh, uh, um, earthquake will hit Haiti in which 300,000 people will die. And then they prognosticated a utopian Haiti, a Haiti that would emerge around 2086, in which you know Haiti is once again the pearl of, of the Antilles, and the, the and the, not only the pearl of the Antilles, but also a science hub, a Haiti in which you you, you know hydrocarbons aren't used, and alternative uh, um, um, uh, form of fuel are are introduced. So this is another avenue for scientific writing as well. What would these alternative forms look like on the island? Absolutely. Uh, yes, in my own writing, I've been trying to create a utopian um, environment for the people living on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I'm thinking of the reader who wants a positive out outlook and a positive read. Uh, but in fact, I think there will be much fighting, infighting, and goodness knows what's happening uh, on a colony elsewhere in the universe. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, what I have enjoyed from your presentation is to see the wide range of varieties, uh, of varieties of factors influencing um, the way the history of Haiti is developed. Oh, yes, yes. Tremendous history, tremendous history. Um, a, la a last question. Um, in the countries I've traveled to, uh, particularly with Great Britain, there have been lots of myths presented. King Arthur, mm -hmm. um, the Loch Ness Monster, all of these things. Some of these we realize are real myths. Mm -hmm. uh, some we are sort of, non, the, the verdicts are still to be open. And some of these um, are obviously um, true. And do you feel that it is part, uh, part of the responsibility of um, publicizing Haiti for um, uh, visitors? that um, there the be a clear definition and clear delineation between what is truth, what is maybe, and what is definitely um, a false. 
Oh, that that's an interesting one. It, and because in Haiti, as Max would myth, facts and fiction are, are impenetrable. <laughs> you can't decipher one from the other. In fact, majority of the Haitian historiography on the revolution is itself steamed in myth, fiction, and facts. Um, for example, the apotheosization of Jean-Jacques Dessalines as a, a loi, a political warrior, um, the belief that uh, um, the prognostication of the revolutionary heroes themselves, um, the ceremony of Wakaima is itself up for debate. Some will argue, some in the West will argue that ceremony never happened. Um, but in the, in the Haitian mind, this happened. Um, as we done taught this God sent as we to fight on our behalf. Um, in fact, what I'm contemporarily work, I just had I had a piece published recently in which uh, I'm trying to demystify the laws of the dead, Gede, to understand what do they say about consciousness and where consciousness goes when we die. And many Western scholars have taken the prognostication because we celebrate Gay Day November 1st, every November 1st. So the day after Halloween in Haiti, everyone goes to the ceremony and Gay Day, it is believed that people are embodied by these spirits. And one of the characterization of these spirits is that they prognosticate the future. They tell you what's going to happen. So if that's the case, that means that tells and tells you that life is deterministic. We don't have free will and everything is deterministic. And many Western scholars, they've tried to interpret the whole ideas of Gede within postmodern and post-structural thought. I'm, a, I'm against that. Elizabeth McAllister, she does, she does a lot of work into that. Um, they discount uh, uh, the prognostications, whether or not they're true, they come true, they come to fruition. They Many Western scholars discount these prognostications. Um, they even prognosticate your death. Um, so it's hard in Haiti to demystify what is truth, what is fact, what is fiction. So all of that, whenever you're doing the, the, the history of Haiti are boiled than one. For example, when we get to get back to the Haitian flag, we celebrate the Haitian flag May 18th every year. The understanding is that the flag was developed by the founder of the country, Dessalines, who had a woman, Catherine Flan, sew the flag. Out of anger, he ripped the white of the French, blue, red, and white. He rips the white out and he combines the blue and red, and hence, that's the Haitian flag. Many Haitians will tell you that it is fact. It happened. By no means did it happen. In fact, the, the flag, the celebration of the flag doesn't emerge until the U.S. occupation of the island, and it was an affront against the uh, um, it, against the U.S. occupiers. Because whenever Haiti is occupied, Dessalines somehow becomes a, 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 a liberating force that they appeal to because he was such a great warrior. So it's so hard to uh, separate fact, fiction, and myth. And Haiti, they all so are one. That, I suppose that uh, this is the hook that yes. the, catches the tourist to come to Haiti. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Discover for yourself the truth. The truth, yeah. And, and, and the that truth. was the model during the seventies under Papa Doc to discover the truth of Haiti. Uh, um, you know, the symbol. We still have the forts all from from the Haitian Revolution, and nothing has it. <laughs> no progress, but. You know, hopefully the young scholars emerging, Dr. Joseph, we have numerous young scholars who are starting to, you know, uh, um, Africanize Haiti, um, demystify Haiti, and, 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 and give pride back to a people, a prideful people who are very prideful people. Thank you. All of Africa looked at Haiti at one point. Yes. Thanks, Paul. Thank, well, you, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Macomb, for a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Yeah, really. 
And it also reflects the fascinating uh, history of Haiti, of course. I mean, I want to share something maybe you may know or may not know, but that revolutionary spirit uh, in Haiti somehow carried over. And uh, during a major important debate at the UN, whether to grant Libya, which is in North Africa, its independence, it, um, they put so much pressure on the Haiti representative to vote against the granting Libya. And he stood up against that pressure. And it was the vote that flipped the, 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 uh, the count into yes. granting Libya independence. And he, he expressed that I think the representative that you know this is in solidarity with an, another African nation. Was, Absolutely. And yes. it, it goes beyond that because we took that revolutionary spirit also to Latin America because we aided Simone Boulevard in liberating uh, the, all of Latin America, um, Ecuador, uh, um, Venezuela. In fact, many people don't know this, uh, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, they maintained the blue and red flag as part of their own flag and simply added the yellow in honor of the aid that Haiti gave them during in independence. In fact, prior to his death, Hugo Chavez, um, he, he, uh, uh, he gave aid to Haiti based on the solidarity from uh, Alexander Pétion in the 19th century who helped Simone Boulevard with, with money, soldiers who fought to liberate Latin America. Interesting. And also, I mean, that's fascinating. I did not know that. But also they, they, they maybe from the, its history, they, they produced, Haiti, Haiti produced quite, an, quite amazing constitutional scholars. Yes. And, yes. and, and they aided nascent nations in, their, in, in writing their constitutions. Yes, absolutely. Which is quite fascinating in itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a question, though. I have a question that you may have touched on it uh, briefly, or but maybe I did not um, pay attention. Is there the okay? The, the structure is you know African, mulatto, and Creole. This is the kind of the general yes. um, structure, and it's historical in terms of how and all of that. How does it carry now? I mean, you mentioned that, you know, um, they came and the Milado took over and, and stuff like that. Number two, are these um, separate, you know, socioeconomic or class system, do they intermarry? Do there, are there difficulties, uh, uh, ongoing difficulties? What, what's the, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yes. So, um, number one, under French rule, these classes were reified as distinct classes under the black codes. They were, so the mulatto elites rarely married Creole blacks. The Africans never married. <laughs> they were so far removed from, from the capital where the mulattoes and the Creole blacks. And the Creole blacks would become landowners. Now, post now, this does not mean that there weren't mulattoes who sided with the Creole Blacks and the Africans. Absolutely, there were, we had great mulatto uh, revolutionary leaders who uh, um, fought. In fact, the writing of uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines' Constitution of 1805 was written by a mulatto. Um, contemporarily, the classes are the, they're not they're, they're racial classes, but they're more so governed by class. So it's easy for success for a Creole black contemporarily or a black bourgeois man is seen when he marries a mulatto woman. And he's only able to marry a mulatto woman if he achieves in the society monetarily or educationally. So, however, it is rare that a, a mulatto man 
will marry an, an African or a black woman. So it's easier if he has the class status for a black man to marry a mulatto woman and it is for a mulatto to marry a black woman. Also, the class, the mulatto class or the elite class has been uh, uh, um, incorporated by a Syrian elite that was during that, that came to the island during World War I. So now the majority of the elites in Haiti not only includes the mulatto class, but it's also a, a Syrian class. And this Syrian class, they're elite. They they uh, they rarely marry outside uh, uh, their Syrian population. Um, so the class structure, although it's not it, it's not openly uh, racial, it is simply class based. But there's still some racial components to it as well. So and, and that it, continues today. And is it based in part on colorism too? Um, yes, very much so. Very much so. In fact, if you're a successful black man in Haiti and you don't, and you're not married to a mulatto or a Syrian woman, it, it, you're, it, you're shocked. You're, you're shocked. So the colorism is still there. Uh, but it's more so buttressed by, by the class factor. So if you're able to obtain wealth, whether it's educationally, or, or, or uh, by other means, you're able to marry into the, the, the elite class. For example, if we look at Papa Doc, who wasn't Haitian, but Papa Doc was married to a mulatto and his son, Baby Doc, would marry a mulatto woman. Uh, uh, um, so Michelle Binet was mulatto. In fact, she, she's related to me uh, um, on my father's side. So when you're successful in Haiti, the, 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 the look, it's like Brazil to some extent. Successful footballers marry, you know, white women or, or, or uh, uh, light-skinned women. So it's similar to the Brazil, although race and color, they're, they're not talked about, but it's still a part of the society. And, 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 and can, I, can I say or hazard to say that the... Uh... Most of the presidents were mulatto based. Uh, they practice something called politique de doublé. What they would do is, uh, and this is post the unification of Haiti. After the death of this Aline, um, there was a struggle between um, the mulatto and the land of mulatto Alexander Pétion and um, Henri Christophe, and they separated the country into two. You had the northern kingdom in the Southern Republic. Jean-Pierre Boyer unified the country, but because the country was dominated by Africans and the Blacks, what the mulatto elites did, they maintained constitutional control over the country, and they used the Black figurehead as the president of the country. We call that in Haitian historiography, politique de doublé. So they always had a, a dark skin um, uh, political political figure, but socioeconomic power remained with the mulatto elites. It's rare in Haiti to, that you will find the mulattoes run or declare for the presidency. Um, they usually hide behind a, a, a black elite to do that. Interesting. Thank that you. will explain the assassination, of, for example, of the previous president, Jovenel Moise, because he was he was a, a, a figurehead. And you had the Syrian and the mulatto elites operating in the background. He was simply a figurehead. He was he was from the peasant class. And it's when he transgressed and tried to uh, uh, basically side with the peasantry, that's when they assassinated him. He tried to rid the island of all of many of the neoliberal policies that the previous mulatto president, Michelle uh, uh, um, Sweet Mickey Matelli, had adopted. And, you know, they killed him. They assassinated him. So the politics still goes on today. 
And this is the problem that he had with Jean Bertrand Aristide. He tried to side with, with the majority of the, the, the Africans on the, on the island. I suspected so. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The problem Thank is you. they're afraid to assassinate him because they know that the, the, the masses would go crazy. He's so popular till this day. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for our speaker? I see there's still six of us here. Well, I wanna thank you again for a, a fantastic and very informative presentation, uh, Professor McComb. And I, I just, uh, I'm, I, I can hardly take it all in. I mean, it, it is very fascinating the way that now I see these connections and I'm even wondering, well, one fast final question. What do you think of the holiday Kwanzaa? Oh, I, I'm not a fan. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm against any, all of this forced essentialism. It's a contrived religion by Milana Karenga and it's, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's absurd. It, it, it lacks any authentic, authentic connection to material reality. You know, you're trying to force force something on African-Americans who are Americans, you know, to, to be honest, if we are honest as social scientists, the, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the notion of Africanism. Um, the, 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 the black American is nothing but an American. Yeah, and we have to think once we embrace that, you know, then we can deal with the uh, uh, racial issues. First, we have to demystify this notion that the African-American is an African. If we look what, if we look at what um, Barack Obama did to Africa, he was worse than any of the pre presidents that came before him. Look what he did to Libya. And this is a black man. This is a, a so-called African man. And you recolonized the colony. It is under Obama that we have Africom and all of these other uh, bases emerging on the colony. And so once we start to demystify the whole Afrocentric movement, and then there's a move towards that, so and and for me, I build off Fanon because this is the critique that Fan, uh, Franz Fanon is having of the negritude movement that emerges in the 1950s. That we have to stop essentializing and come up with a new humanism by which we're we're we're, we're to salvage humanity. But if we're trying to uh, e e e e you know come up with all of these identities and then you get into identity politics. It's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in that because it, it's a problem in all of our organizations in the United States, the voluntary Absolutely. organizations, yeah. where now, you know, we have groups that are, uh, I don't know if essentializing is the word, but they want to be heard. And I can, as someone in my field is rhetoric, I understand wanting to be heard. And it's, it's, but, but, all I can say is very complicated, you know. But Gloria it begs the question: heard to say what? I, I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with with the debate between Homie Baba and Gaitri Spivak. Spivak wrote in a subaltern speak. And, yes. And, oh yeah. Uh, for for Spivak, no, the subaltern cannot speak from its original position. And for Homie Baba, develops this whole ambivalent space from which the subaltern can speak. But speak to say what? What did Obama have to say that would say to us that he offers a new humanism that would sal salvage humanity from what we're facing contemporarily? So uh, uh, it, it's the same issue that I have with the notion of intersectionality that Karen Williams would introduce because mm -hmm. it, 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 it's the same form of oppression that is giving you the rise of you know black oppression, mm -hmm. uh, sexism, heterosexism, et cetera. I, for me, uh, a person, what's the difference between a Bill Clinton and his wife, Hillary Clinton? There's none. And she's supposed to be a woman, okay? Does she offer an alternative voice, an alternative position from that of the hundreds of years of patriarchy we've suffered on? For me, she's more patriarchal than Reagan or any of these other patriarchs that came before mm -hmm. Well, she's definitely a hawk. I have one other question. <laughs> what do you think of Isabel, uh, um, I'm forgetting her last name, the book on caste? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I wrote What's a book. What's her last called, name? I can't think of it. Uh, her last name slips my mind. Oh, okay. Years ago. Because of her journalism, I think she underanalyzes this the, the issue. Uh, I did write with, with, with Routledge some years ago with a, a, an English scholar by the name of Dr. Tomlin, Carol Tomlin, out of Leeds University. We wrote a book called On Black America and Blacks in the UK, in which we, we came up with the notion that Isabel would use called a racial casting class. And this was a critique of W.E.B. Du Bois in which I argue that Black Americans emerged as a racial caste in class. And I think Isabel may have cited my work, but, um, I, I, and as, an, as a trained academic, I, I, not to say I look down on journalists trying to write academic, <laughs> academic books, but mm -hmm. um, I think she underanalyzes the situation. I do see the emergence of, especially the Black American as a racial caste in class. So that's why you would get in Black America the emergence of what E. Franklin Frazier calls the Black bourgeoisie, the Blue Vein Society, and how the Black elite, the quote, and I, I don't I don't fan myself on quoting Thomas Sowell. I think a lot of his stuff is full, full of it, but mm -hmm. um, you know, there is there, there is a group of elites in Black America that would shape. Uh, uh, and become the black political elites that would uh, uh, um, lead Black America down the path of um, assimilationism. But that's my position. <laughs> well, I I appreciate all that you're doing. I hope I wasn't showing all these searches that I was doing. <laughs> oh, I, I, I try. I try. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm afraid you were. I was. I think oh, Karen I'm had sorry. a question. Karen, yeah. I think you had a question, yeah. right? Karen, did you have a question for me? Um, I had a question. Uh, hi, let me see. I'm I, I thought everybody froze for a minute. Um, no, I just had a few things. I mean, I was in Haiti once. Mm -hmm. I was in Haiti on a vacation in the nineteen in the nineteen seventies. I'm not sure exactly what year. Uh, before seventy six, maybe seventy five or seventy four. Mm -hmm. um, and and I got there, and there there was just so much poverty that it was not a place to have a vacation. Really, I made the person with me leave after a day. I couldn't mm. do it. Yes. So you would. I, I really appreciate all that you have told us today because it puts a different face on Haiti for me. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that I was thinking. I don't know if you've read Ministry for the Future or if it interests you. It's a Kim Stanley Robinson. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it, and I'm I really just like a quarter of the way in it, is that it's speculative um, science fiction. Mm -hmm. And he actually talks about a world government and whether it's the perfect world government or not it gives you things to think about in terms of how that's a possibility. And the, and the, the Ministry for the Future is, uh, is named because they're trying to save the climate for future generations. Could I interject? We have had that since H.G. Wells, Karen. Yeah. That was his big thing, was a government, a world government. It was called the Airmen or the Technocrats, and it got debunked, but... Um, the thinkers mm. often seem good in theory, and that's what Kim Stanley <laughs> Robinson is doing. And then when when push comes to shove, it's like Isaac Asimov and robots. There are a lot of things he didn't get about robots. He had it all figured out in the three laws of yeah. robotics that they shouldn't hurt human beings, et cetera, et cetera. But he didn't know things like that once they were programmed, a program can become corrupted. Yeah, it's like people can become corrupted, and that's where H.G. Wells foreshadowed, and we should give credit where credit is due. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson is big at the moment, but many of these people draw on, they stand on the shoulders of giants, even if the giants didn't prognosticate correctly at times. And if you go back and read The Shape of Things to Come, you will find almost exactly what you're saying about Kim Stanley Robinson's government of the world. And these are these are important things to know. Science fiction, like every other field, tends to have 
gaps in its own history. But I think, you know, this new thing that uh, Dr. McComb is coming up with are uh, ways to view things that are already in existence through the new technologies or the new education levels that people are at who didn't used to be able to subject these same things to a new analysis. And that's what I find really fascinating. And, and also that, that you know all about uh, Nettie Okorafor and that many of the things in her novels, which are science fiction, everybody yes. sees their science fiction. And uh, I was wondering about uh, the Chinese presentation we had last time. There were, there were probably, I don't think that folklore says everything is interchangeable between Native Americans and China and, and Haiti and Africans, but there are certainly traditional belief systems that are not materialist. And I think we can say that most of them were not formed under the scientific methodology or the scientific yes. method of um, peer editing and, and blind tests and you know controlled situations. So um, many of it was is, is speculative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that these are these are new things where it used to be a hard wall between the educated scientist and folk any kind of folk wisdom, mm -hmm. and now it's becoming more of a. So, but would you credit that to postmodernism? They would take credit for that. Oh, wow. Um, no, because I, I would say, you know, Schopenhauer reaches the same conclusions um, we find in Hinduism, and he does it all within Western science uh, or within Western epistemology. So I would not say it's all a, a, a result of, and, and Schopenhauer predates. Um, Postmodernism, post-structuralism by 100 years or so. So no, I, I wouldn't say that. And then postmodernism, post-structuralism, they have their own issues. I have my own issues with Derrida. I have my own issues with Foucault. You know, and, and I also do. I have a lot of issues with postmodernists, but also the cognitive um, psychologists who tend to subsume language under brain uh, structures. I think that there are there are problems with all of any lens you use, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, other lenses that would claim that we can we can look at that more accurately than what you're I, doing. I'm more I'm more sympathetic to Chomsky though <laughs> than I am to any postmodernist or post structuralist. Uh, I, I think Chomsky is on the right path. I think postmodernism, post structuralism gives us a critique. Of the of modernist epistemology, but it does not refute modernism. That, that's the problem that I have. Many scholars view postmodernism and post-structuralism post as though it's refuting the ability of us to do science or modernist epistemology in general. I don't believe I don't subscribe to it. There's a blind spot in uh, modernity that is left out that postmodernism and post-structuralism is highlighting. That's how I view it. But once we correct that blind spot, we can continue to do modernist or materialist science as usual. That's how I view it. It's almost like a dead end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. See, postmodernism, post-structuralism tries to say modern epistemology is at a dead end and we can't go any further. Mm -hmm. because everything now becomes subjective and there's no, it, 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 it's reintroducing Kant in this distinction between phenomena and noumena. I don't, I don't make that distinction. I do, I do believe we can know the nature of reality as such. So you agree with Kant? Yes. Well, no, so I disagree, disagree with Kant. With Kant. Yeah, yeah, I disagree he, with Kant. Yeah, yeah right. Kant says we can't know the nature of reality as such. I do. I do believe, especially the research now that's going on into that we find coming out of the post-materialist. Um, even if we if we look at the work, somebody mentioned Stuart Hameroff in one of the chat questions. Um, the work he's doing at UA right. uh, with anesthesiology and um, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Near-death experiences. 
I believe, yeah, we, we do have the potential to know you enough. If so we take the, that's the without, without any, what is that, um, who was it that said, when you examine something, you change it? Was that Heidegger? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so knowing Newman, yeah. I would mean you wouldn't be tampered, you wouldn't. You wouldn't change doing it, anything, yes. But Even a modern physics is saying that there are some physicists who will argue that to uh, uh, we can, uh, what we see is basically subjective and we don't, we can't, there's no way to objectivity. I don't subscribe to that view. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on the same path as Penrose and Hammerall. Right. I well, I just, I, I'm sorry, I didn't even cut you off. No, here, but I, I think it's very much situated as we would say in rhetoric, you know, who is the speaker, who is this spoken to, who is, what is the speech, what's it about? Well, I mean, if you need- That's very high to hear if you need some cure for something, you're probably not going to stand there debating whether it's <laughs> real or whether we can know that this is real. Yes, or exactly. You say, give me the shot. I want the shot. So, that's, Very high to Gary. So that's, uh, that's the pragmatic. I think that comes out of uh, William James and pragmatism. So that, that's another lens to look through everything. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, it, well you know, the, 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 um, you know, Heidegger was very symp uh, uh, sympathetic to William James, you know, so. Mm. Well, anyway, we've given a lot of names. We should have had a reading list or a the go back and check out the <laughs> really? psychologist list. But you bet. Yes. It's something I hope you were jotting down some of the names that Professor McComb was giving because uh, these are very worthwhile threads. And if you could send me a list of just a few of these um, thinkers on voodoo. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, absolutely. And I can forward I, 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 it to the, at least to the people who came to this meeting. Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. I'll do that. Okay. Well, we are now at two hours. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, this was a good one. Yeah, we're gonna go. Thank and, you. So, thank, thank you. you so thank you for having much. me. And we will be back. And I hope that you will join some of our other Professor McComb, some of our other speakers. It would be good if we have past speakers interact. Oh, with absolutely. I would love to. Just send speakers. me the link. I would oh, love let me to. tell you who's coming. Let me tell you what we have. Oh, we have Tosi Abendiga. And Tosi is very popular in our group. He's actually from a Tucson. And he works in electrical engineering and he always talks with prognostications about the internet of things okay. and what's coming. And, and he was the one who coined the phrase, the internet of shit, because he said <laughs> there's things you can do with the internet that you could build, but you, you don't need to like laser, writing laser names on your toast, you know, and things oh, like okay. that. <laughs> he's very popular. So he's coming up for July 2nd. Oh, absolutely. I, I love to join that. All right. Well, I hope you all have a very good rest of today and we'll be seeing you at our next meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all. It was great. Thank you all. Good night. Oh, and I have to I have to turn off the recording. Wait, let me do that. You you can all go, but I have to remember to do this wherever it is. Oh, here it is. Stop recording. There we go.